Hi everyone. I am sorry uh, about what just happened earlier. We really didn't have any control um, or we do have control over that, but that was my first time or our first time at the coalition um, experiencing um, that type of hijacking on Zoom. I didn't, I've never, this has never happened to me or to the coalition. So um, yeah, so thank you for coming back. It seems like we lost like half of the people that were on, um, which sucks, um, but um, yeah, let me see. Okay, so yeah, I think from now on, um, the coalition will be moving to passwords um, and making sure that we're only having webinar based. And this sucks because like we would like to have these engaging conversations with our communities um, and you know really have these constructive and like good dialogues to move forward but obviously that can't happen um, because we do have um, crazy people watching our watching and monitoring our organization and so it's just something that um, we have to deal with, unfortunately. Um, so thank you all for coming back. Um, so let's start again. <laughs> Rewind. Please burn some cedar. Please say your prayers for us. Um, because this, this shit is uncalled for. Um, and again, when we talk about the access um, and services um, or even just having conversations about violence against native women and lgbtq individuals this is oftentimes what oftentimes what happens and it seems like whoever hijacked our um, webinar earlier intentionally did this and so um yeah and this is being streamed on facebook and so yeah we'll get started um so again, my name is Cheyenne Antonio, and I am Hulsoe, and I am from Torreon, Pueblo Pintado, New Mexico. I am currently um, coming to you live from <laughs> Counselor New Mexico <laughs> with very limited internet service. And so with all of that happening, like, oh my God, oh my God I'm not even gonna talk about it no more. Okay, so if we could get to Marissa and Melanie um, to introduce yourselves again. Um, I'd highly, highly, greatly, greatly appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, thank you to the coalition so much for um, shutting all of that down. Technical difficulties happen during COVID-19. We've all kind of experienced them here or there. Um, but yeah, that was uncalled for and, and really grateful for you all for um, doing what you did as fast as you could. So uh, with that, I'll just start with a self-introduction. Um, Good evening to you all who are returning again and to anybody that's joining new. Uh, my name is Marissa Naranjo. I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo, as Cheyenne had mentioned. Um, I serve as the one of two policy coordinators for the All Pueblo Council of Governors. Um, which represents our 20 Pueblo nations of New Mexico and Texas. And I oversee and manage three of the six priority areas, including natural and cultural resource preservation, state and uh, federal legislation, and youth leadership development. So um, thanks again for joining us. I just, again, want to wish you and your families, um, you know, good health, that you all are taking care of each other during all of these um, unprecedented times. Um, I also just wanted to start by, you know, sending prayers and strength, lifting up all of the voices of our families who, or love, our families who have loved ones that, you know, have been stolen or missing, those families who are still fighting for justice for their loved ones. Um, you all are really like at the forefront of this movement. So thank you so much for, you know, being outspoken when it's hard, um, having the courage, um, to pursue justice and for all of your leadership. Um, and again, just really grateful to be on the panel with um, Danae's sisters, Cheyenne and Dr. Melanie Yazzie. Um, love all the work that you do in admiration from afar. 
and just really looking forward to all of this discussion on protecting our land, what land body violence means, what consent means to us. All of these things are really tied together um, in ways that our Native people have been, you know, advocating, recognizing, celebrating, and fighting for um, a very, very long time. So really happy to just be in that tradition with you both here and all the folks listening. Um, and I guess with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Dr. Melanie. Great, thanks Marissa. I uh, just wanted to reiterate what you said. I feel really honored to be on this panel with the two of you. You both are an inspiration and you do incredible work um, for your people, um, particularly I think with, uh, uh, around Native women's rights and, and Native feminism in different ways. And so I really appreciate it. So just again, um, I'm Melanie Yazi. Bilakana Mishle Ma'adeshkizni Bashish Chin, Bilakana Bashachir, Otkotoni Dashinola, Behalge, the Benasha, Kut Az Adane Mishle. So I just wanted to greet all of my Dene relatives, Shik E, Shik E, Doshib Ne'e, who might be listening. I apologize for getting cut off earlier. I really appreciate the coalition, like handling that super fast. Um, I am a professor of Native American Studies and American Studies at the University of New Mexico. I'm calling here from occupied Tiwa territory, otherwise known as Albuquerque, which is the UNM main campus is, is located in Albuquerque. And I've been hearing a lot through different email listservs that um, women of color in particular have been experiencing these kind of Zoom hacks, um, whether it's black women who are teaching classes um, at, in elementary schools, or at the post-secondary level like I, um, like I do as a professor, um, in, you know, racial slurs and pornography. Um, and so it's clearly like white people <laughs> doing this is what I'm gonna say. Um, and so today is MMIW, you know, Awareness Day. And I don't know, I just don't have time for any of that. We're constantly surrounded by it. It's the reason that kind of settler misogyny nonsense is the reason why so many of our relatives are missing and murdered and like, whatever, I would like to actually just focus on our community and our sisters today and our LGBTQ relatives. And so I would like to encourage folks to just put that aside. I burned some cedar in between so that we can just focus on this fierce conversation with these fierce, beautiful women. So I'm gonna hand it back to you, Shai. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Mel. Um, okay, so getting started, um, and discussing land and body violence, um, what kind of came out of this is really um, having conversations with families, um, families, tribal leaders, our elders, and overall just the struggle of Native people and how it constantly, when it's many struggles, but how many more struggles do we got to focus on, especially now with a pandemic currently happening um, and having to not only um, think about, um, having to not only think about our rights to our bodies, but also rights to our land and clean water, clean air. Um, and with that, um, and how I got started in all of this work is really around, um, losing uh, my my relatives within the checkerboard region. And so what that means is um, there's multiple um, entities that, oh my, my God, entities that um, own parts of the land. And so there's tribal land, um, BLM land, state land. And so oftentimes when violence um, were to occur um, here on our homelands, we wouldn't really know what the outcome would be. And so um, with that, for an example, um, one of um, uh, my aunties um, and my um, my grandma and my aunties were murdered back in 2014 um, within the checkerboard region. And during this time, a lot of um, Bureau of Land Management leasing was happening within our territory here. And so where I'm from, um, it's originally um, as we call like Dinetka, um, which is the place of emergence for Diné people. And also um, it's within the greater Chaco landscape. And so greater Chaco being the center um, for a lot of our indigenous and um, Pueblo um, nations within the Southwest um, and how sacred and how, um, how much 
of our culture is really at the root of being from here. Um, and I wasn't, so, so knowing that um, and learning more about it with my grandparents and um, learning more about the land, um, learning about our language and our culture, um, just being a resi kid from Eastern Navajo um, and you know, day to day um, struggle and hauling water, but also as I got older um, and knowing how much violence impacted my life and my families and my, my grandparents and my great grandparents and how um, that violence is constantly happening and there's really no stop to it and um, learning about unhealthy relationships and you know learning that the learning about healthy relationships and how that's interpersonal but also how that's governmental right like our unhealthy relationship with the federal government our unhealthy relationship um with settler nations so yeah new mexico and so um i think we see that more than ever um, with a pandemic happening and our people experiencing it firsthand um, and we see that within border towns, um, with the current Gallup shutdown, and also what is happening in Page, Arizona, for our Native people to be targeted within this border town, within border towns. And if we really do like think about border towns as um, original man camps, right? Because these border towns were founded um, to sort of, not sort of, to create um, jobs um, for for um, individuals who aren't from here um, and aiding them through shelter, um, supermarkets, um, exploiting our land, exploiting our territory and our bodies. And so um, at the coalition um, and the way we look at it and also in correlation with like the Red Nation, I, I definitely see how um, there is a pattern of violence. And I think both all of us could attest to that and really speak on it. And so um, back to like where I'm from and how I've like really made these connections um, is after losing my, my, my family members to really brutal violence. Um, a lot of our, the violence here is very brutal. Um, I've, I've noticed that a lot of the way I lose my relatives is really to the core, like very brutal, especially mothers, um, young girls. Um, and I think we could see that with um, you know, Ashlyn Mike, um, our sister, Misty Upham, um, L'Oreal Sinogeny. And so there are countless Native sisters um, who are young, um, who are thriving, um, who really like fought for their lives during this time, but also um, had a long connection with their families, their culture, and um, yeah. So it all connects with each other and there's no way of separating it. And oftentimes within the MMIW struggle, uh, we hear that um, to where it's just, um, it's just one-sided and focused like through a social problem rather than connecting it back to um, our land. Um, and I think that's why it's so important to talk about it because now that we are in the corner to fighting our lives, to fighting for our lives and our existence, that it's really coming to protecting our elders and our language um, and our cultures and making sure that we are holding them because they're libraries, right? Like they, they hold all the knowledge and um, you, you got to earn it. <laughs> and so we got to protect our elders at all costs. And so, um, yeah, so I just like to acknowledge that. And currently um, the Bureau of Land Management is continuing a lease sale um, within the um, here, Eastern Navajo, down in Las Cruz, um, Carlsbad region, in the southeast part of New Mexico. And all of these leasings have been happening without our consent and um, without tribal consultation. Um, and I think when we talk about tribal consultation, um, I don't really think it means anything because the decisions are made, they're already made for us. And so we're forced um, into these decisions um, as hard as we advocate. And I think it's very, like, it's very important to remember um, power. Um, it's very important to acknowledge our indigenous communities who have taken a step, um, such as Standing Rock, 
um, and the resistance camps up there, um, our grandmothers within Black Mesa, um, our relatives down in Oak Flat, and how, um, and now with Keystone XL and seeing um, a lot of Indigenous women and LGBTQ2 plus folks coming together um, and rising to stand for the homelands, to protect their languages, to protect the women, and really correlated to um, man camps and how it's, how it's important to stand for our bodies and making sure these man camps aren't within our tribal communities because there's such um, a lack of response when it comes to tribal um, police, when it comes to, you know, the state responding to a crime. And so all in all, um, it's a hard struggle and um, I'm really glad to have this conversation um, with the two of you. And um, yeah, so I, I like to just pass it on to Marissa and sort of just give like a back, um, yeah, give it to you, Marissa, sorry. <laughs> cool, thanks Shai, that's all really powerful. I really always enjoy hearing you speak because you just say what needs to be said and you know, what's happening at the ground level is exactly what, you know, folks that are at you know, higher levels of leadership and government really need to be listening to. Um, so I am going to, like Shai, kind of just give a background of how I came into this work or how I was kind of called into this work. Um, I don't, a lot of the times this work, you know, you, you don't voluntarily step into it. It's kind of something that, that um, calls you and is kind of a responsibility. So, um, yeah, so I just, I also wanted to give a quick overview of what I'll be talking about a little bit later. So yeah, I'll be going into um, some personal stuff a little bit and then kind of um, provide some context for the rest of our discussion on the important distinction between environmental racism and colonization and why we need to be looking at um, this MMIW, addressing MMIW, um, uh, trans two-spirit, you know, plus through the context of looking at it as a piece of ongoing colonization. So hopefully, um, you know, that'll help frame uh, going into a very condensed summary on the history of Pueblo land dispossession um, as it's intertwined with the violence perpetrated against our Native women, trans two-spirit community members, and really do this kind of in order to show how um, this history has built a foundation for our present moment the ongoing environmental struggles that Shai was talking about that take place on our homelands here that our pueblos and tribes are, you know, addressing collectively. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll go into a little bit of um, my backstory, which is um, that I graduated from the University of New Mexico with a degree in Native American studies, um, concentrating in Native nation building, which really focuses on the intersections of the political and legal relationship our tribes have with the United States. Um, but how I really came into this work in, in a really heartful way was, um, you know, during my last year of college, I became a co-caregiver along with my mom for my great grand, uh, my great grandmother who was diagnosed at the time with terminal multiple myeloma cancer. And I'll just say that, you know, anyone who's provided caregiving for a loved one can probably tell you that it's simultaneously one of the hardest and most tremendous blessings that we can fulfill as relatives um, in our lifetimes. And so like so many of our native people, you know, it, I grew up with my grandma as my second parent, but it really wasn't until like caregiving for her that we both got a chance to just slow down um, and spend so much time with each other in reflection of her life and our family. And maybe most importantly, we worked for days on an extensive family tree spanning like more than 10 generations just from her memory. Um, and that time was really bittersweet just because like I love learning about my family, but you know, and my grandma had stories for every single one of my family members that we listed on that tree. But what I didn't want to focus on, but was also really hard to ignore was the cancer incidence rate in my family. Um, there was really overwhelming number disproportionately women in my family who had been diagnosed with or died of various types of cancer. Um, and this is not an isolated case as many of our Northern Pueblo community members can tell you, you know, it seems as though the unfortunate reality is that the likelihood of having a family member battling cancer um, is very, very high, way too high. Um, 
And it really just becomes very apparent the more that you talk about it with family members here and there, the stories come out that the underlying and really uniform and correct assumption of the cause of all of these um, different kinds of cancer is the legacy of contamination of nuclear weapons operations at the Los Alamos National Laboratory from when it was first established in 1943 through the Manhattan Project with really the sole purpose um, to create the, the world's first atomic weapon, as we know. So it was really from there that I started doing more research, talking with family members, um, reading about the nuclear fuel chain, <laughs> learning about ongoing contamination and health impacts affecting our communities, and started to really take to heart that like so many generations before me, I was inheriting a heavy, heavy responsibility as a result of losing so many women in my family to environmental violence. And little did I know at the time, um, though that this was really only the tip of the iceberg of land body violence on our homelands that I would come to know and really was initially a result of spending that time with my great grandmother. Um, so I also just like wanted to share that because I feel like, you know, globally and locally, we're in a very similar position in which, you know, we're in crisis mode right now, but we also have the rare opportunity to just slow down and spend meaningful time with one another. Um, so I just wanted to encourage everyone you know, that even through these really hard times, um, you know, especially those who have the access and privilege of talking to your relatives, especially your elders, please do so. Like Shai said, they're libraries, um, they're amazing. You know, all we need to do is listen and ask some hard questions because you really never know when um, those conversations are gonna lead to navigate your life on a path that might have been previously unforeseen, but in all likelihood, it'll probably lead to a path that you are very much needed within your families and communities. Um, so I guess with that, and before I go into the next part, I also just wanted to express my sincere gratitude to all of the fierce and loving women, um, you know, in my life who provided that direction for me and who do not get enough credit from, you know, our family, our communities, our, like, the entire world. Um, these women are my heroes, my inspirations, really carry me in this work that I do, including my mom, my aunties, my older and younger cousins, my grandmothers, all of those women who came before us. Um, and then I also would just like to pay homage to one of the first indigenous um, feminists, Paula Gunn Allen, who is from Laguna Pueblo actually, and historian um, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, whose work and analysis really has guided a lot of the organizing that I do. And, a lot of actually what we'll be discussing uh, later on. And um, I guess with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Mel to go into a little bit of more of how she came into this work and then um, continue with the discussion. Awesome, thank you, Marissa and Shai uh, for those presentations. You know, my comments are, I think building off of uh, you know, the really important links that you, you highlight between violence against women and violence against the land vis-a-vis -vis resource extraction, whether it's the extraction of uranium in Navajo land that is then processed and then pollutes Pueblo land up north, right, that goes into the atomic bomb that then kills Japanese people during World War II, that nuclear chain that our, the, the nuclear chain actually makes us relatives through that toxicity, um, through our bodies, but then also our lands because you can trace it through. And I think that this relationship, right, the land body relationality, um, the, you know, the history of, of this framework for understanding that the violence, um, violence upon the land is violence against the people and violence against people is violence upon the land. Um, it comes out of grassroots Native women-led resistance historically against resource extraction. And so I wanted to walk us through this history a little bit of MMIW. You know, the last couple of years we have seen MMIW sort of, you know, spoken about in the halls of Congress in the United States. You know, the Trudeau government back in 2016 did this sweeping report, you know, in the halls of the Canadian settler government. Um, you know, Trump, oh my God, I think he called it Operation Lady Justice or some awful term. Right, but he like all of a sudden Trump is an advocate for MMIW. And you know, before MMIW was just rolling off the tongues of these like corporate politicians so easily, it actually has always been a movement that belongs to Native women who are firmly embedded in grassroots organizing against resource extraction and against colonialism. 
So the organizing has always been pushing back against the settler co-optation of MMIW by the Canadian state or by the United States. And so this being the case, you know, MMIW kind of became a framework for understanding how the violence against Native women is connected to resource extraction around the time that I Don't Know More was emerging, um, where First Nations people, so I Don't Know More was led, it was founded, right, by these Native women in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And, um, you know, what I Don't Know More was pushing back against was an environmental law that the Canadian government was trying to enact that um, would have a strong effect on like, let's say pipelines, like oil and gas pipelines that were violating sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty um, throughout part, specifically the Western part of Canada. And so, you know, I don't know more came into existence and was women led at a time when, you know, native, there was also attention being paid to the native experience in like urban settings like Saskatoon or Winnipeg, which have the highest numbers of uh, highest native populations of any so-called cities or settler settlements basically in Canada. And so there's been a lot written about the high degrees of incarceration and police violence, right? That our native relatives in these spaces face. The Red Nation has done a lot of work down here in the US context around border towns. Albuquerque would constitute a border town. We're surrounded by you know, Pueblo land. We're on occupied Tiwa territory here. And there are high numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women in Albuquerque. I mean, how often do you hear in the news a story about a body that is being dug up on the west side of Albuquerque? It's very often, very often a native sister. It's usually a Pueblo or Diné sister. And so when we're talking about MMIW, we have to understand that the, 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 the discussion and the politics around MMIW has always been linked to a very stridently anti-resource extraction and anti-carcerality framework. And if we can think about those differently, it would be an anti-colonial or a decolonial framework and then an abolition framework. And because that's always what those Native women who started this movement intended for it to be. Um, and so I think what often happens in like the halls of power and the way that MMIW is addressed in those spaces is it's really, you know, it's divorced from its origins and from its larger meaning. And so if we're talking about land body relationality, which is the topic of this webinar, in the context of MMIW, we can't talk about the violence that Native women and Two-Spirit and LGBTQ2 and girls and children face without always, always addressing the violence of resource extraction and the violence that enacts upon the land, but then also the violence of carceral regimes, prison and policing, right, that also, also are the reason for some of these numbers, these high numbers of our relatives who are murdered and missing. I mean, you know, Shai mentioned L'Oreal Sinogen, he was a 27-year-old Diné mother who was gunned down by a white cop in the border town of Winslow, Arizona four, four springs ago. And we did a lot of organizing around that. But she is part of the MMIW, you know, statistic. And she wasn't murdered by some like nameless person. She wasn't murdered by Robert Picton, who is this famous serial killer, you know, in Canada who would pick up um, Native women who are hitchhiking on the Highway of Tears. He was a cop sanctioned by the state to kill Native women. And so when we're thinking about solutions to MMIW, those solutions can't, they can't advocate for more carcerality or like more police or more policing to create some sort of like to lessen those numbers because those are actually perpetrators of the problem and the larger system of incarceration and policing um, in settler societies is absolutely part of the problem. They are predatory when it comes to Native women. Um, and then also when we talk about MMIW, again, because of the history of that movement, we have to always talk about environmental justice. They can't be spoken about differently. They're actually the same. And for me, the evidence of this um, is really just looking at the history of Native women who resist, like historically Native women, particularly Native women who've been engaged and what we, what we now call environmental justice or climate justice work, but in like land defense and water protection over the last 50 years. And I think the progenitors of the MMIW movement now, what we call MMIW, was actually Women of All Red Nations, which was basically like the arm of AIM, the American Indian movement that was led by those fierce warrior women. If you haven't seen it, you should watch the documentary Warrior Women that came out a couple of years ago, details the history of this. But I also think about my own people and the matriarch resistors on Black Mesa, right, who refused to be removed from their homelands in order to make way for coal mining and uh, that kind of resource extractive infrastructure uh, in their communities. And so 
you know, these, these women, these Native women had no choice but to rise up for their very survival and for the survival of their people. And they always talked about their struggles as about being protecting the land, protecting the future, right? Protecting their children, protecting their families, protecting the water. This, the language of being a water protector or a land defender has been around for a very long time. And that language comes a lot from these Native women who have been resisting resource extraction. And so why is that? Why do we think about protection as this like, this mantra of our indigenous resistance struggles? Well, it's because the, the notion of like caretaking and the protecting life and defending life, I think is something that women in our communities and our societies, this is like our central role. It's our central political role as well. Customarily, we were leaders in our societies colonialism ripped that out, right? That's part of the reason why Native women were targeted structurally, um, in addition to scorched earth campaigns. But, you know, our role and like the politics, the feminist politics that have emerged from our land-based resistance struggles really center on this idea of caretaking, of protecting the water, of caretaking the future, right? And so that's why you see a lot of language around care. And right now during COVID-19, the mutual aid networks I mean, even if people don't know, I think those are definitely feminist practices. Um, they're also, they're black and indigenous feminist practices. They're decolonial and abolitionist because that politics of care is so central um, to the way in which we need to protect our people, right? And the way in which protect all species, a multi-species kind of caretaking in the land. And so, you know, that the term water protector that became very popular during the uprising at Standing Rock in 2016 and early 2017, you know, there's a reason why that term was so important, why one identified so strongly as a water protector. And there's a reason why that struggle was largely led by young Native women and Two-Spirit and LGBTQ folks. There's a reason, right? And it's because of this longer history of warrior women who have really given us, who gifted us the skills and the tools and the frameworks that we engage now when we're practicing land-based defense um, as a form of indigenous resistance but also those women who started Idle No More and began using the term or the phrase MMIW to talk about these interrelated issues between incarceration, um, settler colonialism, resource extraction and violence against native women. So I just wanted to kind of take a step back and do kind of a larger overview of that. Cause you know, Shai, you did say, I think often what happens with MMIW, right? Is it's just seen as like a social issue and not an environmental issue. They're like spoken of separately. Um, and so then how do you handle this people problem? Well, you just, there's more police, we can get Amber Alerts, um, we can create policies and acts through Congress. Those, I'm not saying those aren't important things to do to help protect people, but you can't talk about those. And I, I mostly see politicians try to talk about this without talking about this. And you simply can't because the people who started MMIW were always talking about the whole picture, right? The structure of colonialism. And I've really seen the critique of settler colonialism removed actually from the more mainstreaming of MMIW over the past year or two. And so we can't forget where it comes from and what we are obligated to advocate for when we are talking about MMIW. So that's just some of what I wanted to share today. Thanks, Dr. Mill. Um, I'll go ahead and jump off with a lot of the things that you said. Um, yes, so historically land defense, as you had mentioned, has always been about also defense of our women, defense and protection of our lifeways, our languages, our water. And too often these conversations about consent, land body violence for our indigenous people have taken place within this framework of environmental racism and not settler colonialism. And we need to bring it back to settler colonialism in order to understand all of these different structures of violence that are taking place and how to address them, how to deal with them, um, you know, in collaboration with one another, all the way from the grassroots to the government with, you know, all of our indigenous feminists at the front. So um, I guess when I say environmental racism, I'm referring to the institutional rules, all of the regulations, policies, government, and corporate decisions that really deliberately target certain communities based on race for things like locally undesirable land uses, um, lax enforcement of zoning and environmental laws that result in communities being um, 
disproportionately exposed to toxic and hazardous waste, just like we see here in New Mexico. Um, again, based on, based on race for environmental racism. But in the work that I do with our Pueblo nations, you know, from when I was a community organizer to working with our leadership, I really found that that really isn't the appropriate um, it's not appropriate to confine our experience as indigenous people to these terms because our relationship to these lands have existed since time immemorial. Um, the inherent rights and sovereignty of our native nations with respect to our lands really provide that foundation for the um, political government to government relationship, that unique political government to government relationship that our Pueblo nations and tribes have with the United States. Um, our relationship with the US does not derive from our race, our ethnicity, but from that sovereign status as nations. And that's, that's definitely a big part of why we need to talk about MMIW, G2, Spirit Plus, and violence upon the land, not just in the context of environmental racism, but as a result of um, ongoing colonialism from our ancestors' first contact with settlers to right now and into the future. And I guess, in other words, it's kind of like saying we as indigenous people have our own track of our history to look back on and learn from and celebrate, you know, our stories of resilience, resistance, and success in protecting one another against these forces, these institutions, and what have, you know, really developed from blatant violent attacks to um, bureaucratic systems that continue to harm our communities. So we do this really hard work, you know, not just for ourselves and not by ourselves. I think that's really important to remember, but alongside those who have come before us and those generations that are forthcoming. Um, I think that's really important to remember because this is really hard work for a lot of folks who, you know, don't want to look back at the darkest times in our history and remember, you know, that our, our Pueblo people, our tribes actually organized effectively to resist those um, types of violence. Um, but it really starts with acknowledging that violence on the land and violence on our bodies has always been enacted side by side with each other by settler governments against our Pueblos and Native nations, really as tools of conquest for the acquisition and access to our lands, our bodies, and the wealth that we have through our natural resources. Um, so I guess in that way, like these conversations, you know, revolve and always have revolved around consent, land dispossession, and capitalism. Um, and I definitely want to go into a history of the Pueblo land disposition that I was um, talking about, but also I want to give quick three reminders. One, you know, that our indigenous people in New Mexico had extremely developed subsistence and caretaking economies, meaning that the goal of our land use was to like, provide for the needs of our communities while respecting and maintaining our territory's ecological boundaries and those of our mother earth. Um, our pueblos did have gendered roles as I understand in like everyday community life that were equally respected. Um, and lastly, our Pueblos, and maybe particularly most famously Zuni Pueblo, you know, honored and embraced the sacred role of our two-spirit relatives. So I guess let's get in, we can get into the history of how um, land disposition and violence against our Native women has run side by side throughout colonization um, by the three major forces of Spain, Mexico, and the U.S. And then, as you had mentioned, Dr. Mel, you know, all with, you know, Pueblo-led, feminist-led resistance. Um, so the history from Spanish rule, I think it's really important to remember that the first colonial period of land tenure in New Mexico, beginning in 1598, was actually characterized by conquest and imposition of Spanish institutions, like the encomienda system, to force appropriation of Pueblo produce, women, and labor. And, um, you know, these locally imposed systems normalized things like raids, rape, killing, and even torture of Pueblo women, cultural leaders, and our two-spirit relatives. The abuses were well documented, and even when Spanish colonial governments criminalized sexual mistreatment of women, it was rarely enforced at the local level. And so what was more important was how the Spanish, both locally and uh, their government abroad, could use sexual violence to subjugate our Pueblo communities, really diminish uh, traditional forms of kinship, and more effectively force labor for the production of crops and other goods. And so we know that this oppressive and very violent climate led to the organizing of the Pueblo Revolt in 1680. But what most people don't know and what's left out of our most mainstream history books is that, you know, with the so-called peaceful return of the conquistadors in 1962, um, which it was not peaceful, it was very violent, um, also came the Spanish system of slave trade and sex trafficking.
Um, so through this piece of history, we see really the beginning of foreign systems aiming to control our land and our bodies, um, heading into the Mexican Republic under the rulership of Mexico, actually, um, <clears throat> as the second nation to colonize the area in 1821, Pueblo autonomy was respected. However, it was not with respect to the land. For example, the only Mexican government, only the Mexican government could legally authorize the sale and transfer of Pueblo lands. For many Pueblos, there were many problems with encroachment, especially those up north, including Taos Pueblo, who had entered into well-documented litigation multiple times with the Mexican government to contest the acquisition of their Pueblo lands and water rights. Um, also left out of many history books are the revolts that subsequently took place against these injustices and the rising and also against the rising of um, an elite and wealthy Mexican class um, on the backs of Pueblo people. So in 1837, uh, Pueblos and uh, Mexican villagers of the northern Pueblos in the Tewa Basin revolted twice, destroying hundreds of land grant titles and the second of these, the Taos Rebellion, the resistant forces grew based on a class solidarity to over a thousand revolutionaries, including Mexicans, Pueblos, Apache, um, with their kind of military goals being to resist US control and land losses to the Mexican elite. So it was eventually um, subdued by elite Mexi the elite Mexican class and then also the United States who had joined and was working with the Republic to also acquire land in these areas. Um, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, New Mexico was ruled for four years by a military dictatorship under the US Army and Taos Pueblo itself was occupied by a standing army. So I'm, I'm going through this also just so that we can see, you know, after the Spanish government, the Mexican government as a national force continued in, um, you know, the already started subjugation of Pueblo people for the access and acquisition of land, labor, and wealth. And then beginning, um, in 1851, U.S. territorial rule um, by a congressional authority divided all of these lands into counties, which became controlled by elite New Mexican families, and then a new um, demographic of American capitalists. So by the time that American capitalists reached New Mexico, the United States had already established a legacy of mistreatment and violence against Native women. Sexual violence perpetrated by the United States actually represented the earliest form of institutionalized and officially sanctioned sexual slavery in all of the Western Hemisphere. Um, in many instances, you know, we hear we hear a lot of histories of Indian men being killed in battle, but you know, women and children were taken captive by Americans and used for sex, labor, and profit. And even even seemingly sympathetic reformers with the um, of the United States, such as you know this national organization called the Friends of the Indians, uh, minimized the harm caused by sexual exploitation by pointing to the failure of Native women and two spirit relatives to adhere to Western standards of um, femininity, and so. Going back to um, after the installation of the governmental structure in New Mexico by the United States, this is when we see the very beginnings of the United States capitalist extractive economy emerge blatantly on these lands. Um, not only were lands expropriated, but the produ produce of lands are being shipped to other places nationally and internationally. This happened alongside an overgrazing of cattle, extensive timber cutting, pumping of underground water by entrepreneurs. Um, so it was a lot of business corporations really just creating a monopoly and treating the lands and people as mere business opportunities. Um, so um, one of the results during this time was that over 80% of land grants held by subsistence farmers was lost as land ownership became concentrated into the hands of very few. Um, and I guess the simplest way to put it is that, you know, New Mexico became a resource colony marked by cheap labor, depletion of natural resources, ecological destruction, and really just disenfranchised our agricultural producers as one of those first steps. Um, we also know that several different kinds of colonial initiated efforts had been associated with sexual mistreatment of Native women and children, you know, forced migration, mandatory boarding school education, which entailed gendered tasks and urban relocation are just some of the tactics to name a few um, that were specifically aimed to assimilate our nations and remove communities from the land. Um, so that, I know that's a really heavy history and I just wanted to end that piece also by um, 
saying thank you for those who listened through the whole thing, especially our Pueblo people, because I know that those pieces of our history are some of our darkest. Um, but you know what, this, this is exactly why land body violence exists. And we really have to learn these pieces to understand <clears throat> the foundations for the structures of violence we live in today, as I mentioned earlier, and how to confront and address them and what we should be celebrating. Um, you know, the other piece of it is that we really should be celebrating and carrying on the long legacies of resistance that we hold um, historically. And, you know, the policies from the times that they were developed in history that I had mentioned earlier, they were not erased. Um, and we're not far from where, we're not far right now from where those policies came into being. Those policies were built upon and developed into highly bureaucratic, political, administrative, legal systems that we know today. They essentially, without a face, aim to legalize and result in the capitalizing and accessibility to our resources, our ancestral lands, our bodies. And, you know, I think it's a really important question to that folks ask themselves, you know, if, if you know, these systems are so strong and so faceless, like why even actively engage in these systems at all? And honestly, I think we've all been there, but to not engage really just means that we've already lost to the bulldozer of US policy and land use planning and the subsequent health impacts that we continue, um, that will continue at a faster rate, more destructive rate if we don't engage, not just politically, but at all levels from grassroots to government as um, Dr. Mel was saying. Um, so yeah, I think, there's, there's a lot of things going on right now in terms of current environmental struggles. Um, I'm really happy to be working for an organization actually and for Pueblo leadership that actually recognizes this, uses a multi-priority and multi-strategy approach in working on government to government levels with the United States to really fight for and defend our communities, ensure our health and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic and MMIWG2 Spirit Plus preserve our ancestral landscapes at Chaco Canyon and Bears Ears, oppose the nation's largest um, you know, nuclear fuel transport campaign in history by Holtec International, protest NEPA and EPA environmental rollbacks, and address so many other areas that are important to Pueblos collectively and trying to assure, ensure a life-affirming future, and involving our community members in those efforts of policy development, getting folks at the table who are you know, most impacted and who really need to be um, at the table for these like discussions that affect us on a very broad level. So yeah, I think I'll just end with a simple comment, just encouraging folks to support one another. You know, if you have the availability and health, ask your relatives, these organizations, leadership, how you can help out if you don't have a clear direction, but want to help out or want a new direction, build relationships. It's really never too late to start learning and supporting each other. Um, I think it's really that simple. I wanted to make one comment. Is that okay, Shai? Do you need to, is it okay? Um, it'll take like two minutes. Okay. Um, just kind of building on what Marissa said, thank you so much for that context. Uh, you know, we were talking about how the framework of environmental racism didn't quite capture what Native people were experiencing um, in terms of land body relationality in relationship to the ongoing colonial violence we experience. Um, I find that the climate justice framework as well, um, which is often dictated by uh, kind of like white NGOs and white environmentalist discourse um, that also really eclipses and erases indigenous struggle and something we talk about in the Red Deal, you know, the Red Nations policy document about climate justice and decolonization is that like indigenous people have always been at the front line of um, what might be considered climate justice or, or the battle against environmental racism. And it's actually been native women and grassroots um, indigenous feminists who've developed two frameworks that are kind of, that are alternatives to those um, that are very indigenous centered. Um, one is environmental violence. This term came out from the Native Youth Sexual Health Network and Women's Earth Alliance in 2014. They published an entire um, study on it. I can provide the link later on um, if folks are interested. But also the framework of environmental justice came out of radical indigenous feminist work on the ground just like the framework of reproductive justice came out of radical black feminist organizing on the ground um, to address violence against bodies. And so I think environmental violence and environmental justice are very indigenous centered and indigenous derived um, frameworks that are also feminist frameworks for understanding land body relationality. And I just wanted to close with one comment. Um, 
you know, you were talking about all of the different levels of engagement we need to pursue, right, to really address and just stop, to, to abolish MMIW as a thing that happens, that we're somehow just expected to live with as Indigenous people. And I think talking about like the fra how frameworks like environmental violence and environmental justice come from grassroots organizing, the very phrase and the the framework behind MMIW um, being anti-colonial, you know, being anti-capitalist and being anti-imperial, um, supporting indigenous sovereignty, being against resource extraction and the exploitation of land, that that also comes out of grassroots Native women's organizing. I think it's important to remind people that yes, like politicians, whether they're, you know, representatives in Congress, even our tribal leaders um, or folks in the White House or whatever, they can make change but they listen to us, right? Like the MMIW didn't become a thing that people were talking about in mainstream media because you know um, some politician decided that this is something that they wanted to advocate for. Nor did Alicia Ocasio Cortez become, you know, a, a, this you know incredible congresswoman out of nowhere just because she decided she was going to do it. She started her campaign in Standing Rock, right? And so the discourse around MMIW comes from movements, grassroots movements that are really committed to this political agenda of decolonization and the, the you know, advocacy for indigenous sovereignty. And so they follow our lead. It shouldn't be the other way around. And, and when it comes to MMIW, it shouldn't be any different. And the MMIW is so embedded in the environmental justice work and the land defense and water protection we have been engaging in for the last, I'd say the last flare has been about a decade. Um, and even though, you know, like the women's march and Trump's election, I think made the topic of like women's rights more popular again or feminism popular again, I really actually think it's the environmental justice struggles that indigenous people have been um, embroiled in really for the last decade that has created and paved the way for MMIW to become something that people even care about at a larger level. So again, it comes from movements. It doesn't come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up. And I want to encourage people to continue to think about how do we combat MMIW from the bottom up rather than the other way around. Thank you both. I've learned so much just listening to both of you um, to learn about the history of resistance from our Pueblo relatives and sort of the analysis you gave, Marissa. Like, I am blown away. Like, Slay like Pope, organize like Pope, and you know we will stand strong higher. Um, we'll, we will stand stronger. We will stand higher, and um, like it is possible. It is possible to be free. It is possible to be in our homelands and not have, um, not to ask permission as Native women. I think as Native women and LGBTQ two plus folks, it's important that. Um, we're unapologetically being ourselves and our best selves and um, advocating for our communities. And so thank you both so much for being um, role models and caretakers um, for that um, because you both empower me so much. Um, and I've learned so much from the both of you. And so thank you, thank you both for that. And um, from what you've both been sharing, um, I think it's important to acknowledge um, how this violence is continuing and um how i don't know if you guys could hear the oil and gas trucks going so fast um that's that's what did it just causing pass? yeah I, they just i heard it i heard yeah it. yeah and so that um with that i guess as part of like what's going on with the pandemic and the essential workers um our oil and gas workers are um seen as essential workers and so they're not taking time off and so that goes for the current um, BLM, Bureau of Land Management, lease sales that are currently happening. And um, actually these sales are happening online and starting at $2 an acre. And so you can actually go to energy.net um, and see parts of um, all, all of the United States, um, so-called United States in the Western part. Um, so all the way from Alaska, all the way down to New Mexico um, and in between um, our lands and our mineral rights and our water rights or all of it, all of it um, is currently being leased um, and starting at $2 an acre. And so um, the current um, Bureau of Land Management is having um, commenting period and actually having um, community um, hearings through um, online 
and so not a lot of our communities here don't have access um, to the internet and so I hope um, I don't even know like I don't even know at this point of how our voices can be heard um, within that in itself and so again um, finding ways to organize and being good with each other being good to each other um, and moving forward um, with what was shared and brought to our circle here and so um, with that um, if do you, would y'all like to add any closing comments before we close y'all good okay thank you thank you for the opportunity to share this I, I, a lot of the stuff circles around in my mind and i don't get to talk about it <laughs> out loud very often so i really appreciate it and you know marissa like your insistence you're like actually we have had caretaking economies and sustainable life ways for time immemorial in these lands and so this, these are what we build off of, right? We're, we haven't forgotten the power of Native women. We haven't forgotten the power of these ways of life and that practicing those, especially during the pandemic is, and these caretaking economies. And I, I started thinking about caretaking ecologies, even like a multi-species kind of caretaking that doesn't center human beings, that this is a very indigenous feminist practice, that mutual aid is a very indigenous feminist practice, the ethics of kinship and caretaking. Um, and that this is, you know, at a grassroots level in just our relationships with each other, this is one of the things that we have done and we must continue to do to stop MMIWG. Um, I hope that next year we don't have this awareness day <laughs> again, because it's gone. I hope that if it's not gone in the year after that, right? I hope we don't have to have an awareness day and keep having to have this conversation in the future. That's what I hope and just sending all my love to all my sisters and all of my relatives and both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mel, just echoing all of your comments and um, thank you, Shai and the coalition for hosting this super important conversation. I hope that we don't have to, you know, continually address this in the same vein year after year, but we'll, we'll be there. We'll keep fighting and thanks to everybody who's tuning in and, um, really taking to heart a lot of these conversations and those that happened today around the national day. Thank you both. Thank you again. Um, we are, so ways to help, ways to support. Um, we'll be sharing it within our, our Facebook comments. Um, definitely donate um, if you have the means um, to push forward mutual aid and solidarity. Um, there is a Pueblo Relief Fund that has been created and we've shared it before, but we'll share it again. And also um, Navajo, Hopi solid, um, Navajo Hopi Relief Fund, Solidarity Fund. Sorry. Families, Navajo Hopi families. COVID-19 relief fund. <laughs> Thank you. And then there's also a Far East, um, Far East, the NE Community Relief Fund. And so definitely, if you have the means, um, please support our communities. Um, that's the best way we could do right now. And if you have any questions about violence, um, about the structure of violence, of sex trafficking, sexual violence, and domestic violence, um, we do have a website at csvanw.org. Um, and also, if you want to follow the Red Nation, um, they're at the rednation.org. Um, and so, um, yeah, um, with that, um, we are thinking of our families, our family members um, who have been taken too soon, and um, definitely take care of yourselves, um, be smart, um, stay clean, be radical, do it safely, um, we're here for you, and um, take, care of our, take care of our elders, y'all, um, we need to be smart about it. And so thank you and we'll see you later. Yeah. Good night. Thanks all. Take care.